Former U.S. President Donald Trump sat down with Israel Hayom, one of Israel's leading newspapers, for a discussion about the future of the United States and Israel. And of course, he's also a presidential hopeful. Let's uh, see what uh, Israel Hayom asked him. Our first question is whether you support Israel's goal to completely destroy Hamas. Okay, so let me just explain and why it's so sad. If I were president, you would have never been attacked because Iran was broke. They had no money. Uh, China couldn't buy oil from them because otherwise China wouldn't be able to deal with the United States. I said to China, I said to many nations, 47 nations, I spoke to many of them personally, if you buy oil from Iran, you will not do any business in the United States and we're going to tariff your products. Every single one of them agreed. I didn't lose one, not one. And Iran did almost no oil business, you know that. Nobody would buy oil because of me. They were broke. They had no money for Hamas. They had no money for Hezbollah. They had no money for anybody. And uh, now they're sitting with $221 billion in cash, and they control Iraq, which has $300 billion in cash. It's like a subsidiary. Whether you like it or not, it's like a subsidiary, because stupidly, the United States went in and blew everything up. You know, you had two countries that were sort of equal in power, and one of them got blown up by the United States, and now uh, Iran has a big advantage in the Middle East over a lot of other countries. When I saw October 7th, it was one of the saddest things I've ever seen because there was no reason for it. They would have never, ever done that for two reasons. Number one, they were broke. And number two, I was the president. They would have never done that because they knew there would have been very big consequences. All right. That being said, mm -hmm. uh, you have to finish up your war. You have to finish it up. You got to get it done. And uh, I'm sure you'll do that. Now we got to get to peace. You can't have this going on. Uh, and I will say, Israel has to be very careful because you're losing a lot of the world. You're losing a lot of support. But you have to finish up. You have to get the job done. And you have to get on to peace. You have to get on to a normal life for Israel and for everybody else. All right, so just a few comments there. First thing, very importantly, President Trump uh, makes it clear that Hamas is a subsidiary of Iran. That's very important. You're not going to hear that from the Biden administration. They're not going to say to you that the money that we transferred over to Iran had a direct impact on Hamas's attack on Israel. It's a very important thing. There's a global jihad. Iran is one of the heads of it. And Hamas is the, uh, is the actualizer of Iran's ideology. And so that's a very important point. As to the second point that President Trump said, which is that you got to finish up because you're losing a lot of uh, world support. You got to get on with the business of peace. I don't think that's a very good winning strategy uh, when you're talking with the jihad. You have to say to them, I'm willing to make war for a thousand years. I'm not going to back down just because we want peace right now. We don't want peace right now. We want to do our best to go towards peace. But if you're going to make war, we're ready for war. And it's not a ne good negotiating tactic to say, listen, but we got to get over this war and get to peace. You've got to signal to them that you're willing to fight with them forever. It's only then that they're going to start backing down when they see that you're victorious, that you're strong, that you're not willing to just go towards peace in order to, to get to some other goal, which is, okay, you know, to get past this conflict. No, no, no. They have patience, the jihad. And you have to signal to them that you too have patience. And so I think that as a, as a negotiator, right, and a person who wrote the book on negotiation, business negotiation, deals, the art of the deal, the art of the deal is by standing strong and holding your line and not telling them that, yeah, yeah, we want to get past the war and into peace, because then they understand that, that peace is very expensive and that they're willing to milk it. The whole jihad is willing to milk us because we want to get to this other point. So I don't think it's a good negotiating strategy. That's my comment there. So, so if you re-elect uh, in a few months, uh, one, once again, to visit the president, and Israel still may be in a war, how would you help Israel? Well, look, uh, there has been no president better to Israel than me. Iran wanted to make a deal. And with the deal, 90% of the deal that I want to make is no nuclear weapon. That's 90%, almost 100%. It might be 100%. That's all I want. No nuclear weapon for Iran. And it's so sad when I see what's happening in Israel and Ukraine and other places, many other places. Inflation, uh, you take a look at inflation. We wouldn't have had inflation that was caused by his stupid energy uh, policies. And uh, it's too bad. He's the worst president in the history of our country. 
I'm a very loyal person. I've been loyal to Israel. I, look, I've been the best president in history by a factor of 10 to Israel because of all the things I do. The embassy, uh, Jerusalem being the capital, the best location for the embassy, and getting the embassy built. But then you have Abraham Hammercourts, and then you have Golan Heights. Nobody even thought that was going to be possible. I did that. I'd like to pause the president here for a second because he, he talked about the Golan Heights. Remember, Israel already recognized the Golan Heights as part of Israel. Uh, the international community hadn't. The United States hadn't. And when President Trump recognized it, that was a great thing. But just to make it clear, it's something that we already did. Israel already recognized the Golan Heights as part of Israel. So, you know, welcome to reality. Uh, but when it comes to the Abraham Accords, well, that was something. And I think that President Trump and his team deserve the Nobel Peace Prize for uh, the Abraham Accords, which was a window into how things could be, how things should be in this region, which is a strong Israel surrounded by strong Arab countries working together for regional peace and security and prosperity. Uh, and so that was something. So I think that he had it a little bit backwards here. I would say uh, the Abraham Accords is the pinnacle. Recognition of uh, the Golan Heights is nice, but it was like, where have you been all these years? And I did it because of a lot of reasons. Uh, Israel has to do what they have to do, but we have to get to peace because the world is turning and it's not a good thing for Israel. What's happening is not a good thing. I want to show. I don't know what that means exactly. Israel's at war because the jihad is at war with, is with Israel. It's not something that you choose. It's not like I woke up in the morning and I want to have peace. I don't want to have peace. We have enemies. We have enemies. We have to fight them. That's the reality. It's 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 just the way it is. It's not something that I'm like, okay, you know what? Let's just get over this little war thing. It doesn't work that way. I got people who want to make war on me, and they've done a great job at, at 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 rousing their troops and creating the ideology of jihadism, Nazism. Okay, that's my situation, President Trump. So it's not like I can just get over it and just go to the next phase. It's just not like that. We got jihad in the north with with two hundred fifty thousand. Uh, rockets, that's Hezbollah, we got Hamas, we got Iran going for the nuke, we got all kinds of problems. So it's not going to turn on, on one second just because it doesn't look good for the world right now, because it's not cool, it's not trending on TikTok. We got enemies, we got to defend our peoplehood, we got to defend our land, we got to rid the land of jihadism. So let's not just like, let's not just like kind of like, you know, wave it away with, with, um, with, a, with a wave of the hand. It's not going to work that way. We got to fight our enemies and we need a deep breath to have patience, to destroy our enemies, to assert sovereignty on our land. And that's another thing that never happened under Trump, which would almost happen, but it didn't happen. And that is Israeli sovereignty, starting at least with the Jordan Valley, but really on all of the land of Israel, Israel should be sovereign. With you a question that in our minds, every leader in the world should reply. How would you react if, God forbid, it was your children or grandchildren who were kidnapped by Hamas or suffering the horrors that so many Israelis were going through on October 7? On October 7? Uh, I would say I would act very much the same way as you did. You have to be crazy not to. Only a fool would not do that. That was a horrible attack. But it was a, an attack that I blame on Biden because they have no respect for him. He can't put two sentences together. He can't talk. He's when he says that they don't have respect for him, what he means is the Arab world, the jihad, uh, of course they don't have respect for him. He pays them off and he doesn't seem like a strong leader. Now, from here on, you're going to hear President Trump talk in a derogatory manner against President Biden. Look, I'm coming here as an Israeli. I'm here to talk about what's good for uh, the Israeli future, the Jewish future in the land of Israel. I'm not here to diss one president or another. I, I'm, I am very willing to say that President Biden uh, empowers the enemies of Israel, and he's what I call today an Israel shrinker. He's interested in shrinking Israel. Uh, that's for sure. But if he's dumb or not dumb, I basically don't believe uh, that people get to these uh, places in their careers by being dumb. They have to be smart in some way. Uh, and that's just also the posture that I take vis-a-vis -vis people who I deem to be dangerous to me. I like to take them seriously. So I'm not going to be party to the ideas that President Biden is dumb because I actually think he's quite smart uh, uh, where he is in his age and all that kind of stuff. That's really not my business. My point is I take my enemy seriously. For President Trump, maybe it's good for him to kind of 
you know, will look down on, on President Biden and, and minimize him. But from my point of view, the danger of President Biden and his team is very serious, and I take them very seriously. He's a very dumb person. He's a dumb person. We see in changing now to economy issues. Uh, we see rise of inflation actually all over the world, especially in the last two years since the war in Ukraine and then now the war in Israel, including the uh, uh, Suez Canal, which is actually close to the right. to international uh, trade. Um, uh, just to correct here, the Suez Canal is not close to international trade. It's it's the uh, 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 Bab el Mandeb Strait, which is controlled by Yemen. Right. And Yemen is right there, basically. And you've got these Houthis and they're the ones that are threatening, not closing, threatening uh, a global trade because they've slowed down traffic through the Bab el-Mandab Strait, which leads to the Suez Canal. Bottom line is uh, the, the international community and Israel has not taken care of this threat. Let's see what President Trump answers. How do you see the world coming out of this of this crisis? I mean, shouldn't we do not we need strong America to stop all this mess around the world? The problem with the world. Before we even hear the answer there, do we need a strong America? I think I, I can understand that. I can understand why an Israeli uh, journalist would ask that. But my question is, do we not need a strong Israel? Imagine a strong Israel patrolling these waters, maybe together with an ally like India, making sure that these waters are safe for international trade. I'm a little bit tired of us uh, uh, putting our hopes and our security in the hands of somebody else. Israel should be patrolling these waters. Israel should be smashing the Houthis. Israel should make sure that the uh, uh, the Persian Gulf is safe uh, for all shipping uh, and that not threatened by the Iranians. I just believe that it's time for Israel in a power in a world with a power vacuum. We should be standing up and being bigger and stronger right now with the help of God, of course. The world today is Trump isn't president of the United States. If Trump were president of the United States, there'd be no problem with China and Taiwan. There'd be no problem with. Israel being attacked on October 7th, and Ukraine would have never happened. The attack on Ukraine would have never happened. That would have never happened with Putin for two reasons. Number one, he wouldn't have done it if I were president. We used to talk about it. He would never have done it. And very importantly, oil prices were much lower. By the way, you have any plans to visit Israel in the coming oh, I future? I know. I, I've loved it. I've been treated very good there. They say if I ran for, if I ran for office in Israel, I'd get 98% of the vote. All right, so let's just say that uh, would have October 7th happened uh, with President Trump in the White House? I'm guessing that he's right, that it wouldn't have happened. I think that they waited for the opportune moment uh, of President Biden presidency, both financially and in terms of political clout and support. So I personally think that he's right, that they waited and they wouldn't have done it uh, under a President Trump. They would have waited for President Biden. That's what happened. With regarding to the next question of the invitation, you know, you're always invited to come to the Holy Land, come to Israel, come to the God of Israel, come to Jerusalem, come to Tel Aviv. Uh, but at the same time, I don't think that's the real concern. I think the concern is uh, a, gl a globe that is right now off kilter. I mean, the powers today is the Iran, China, Russia, North Korea axis, not exactly an axis of morality. Uh, is America going to fill that void? I don't know. But as I always say to you, and I said before, uh, it's Israel that has to step up to at least fulfill its role, at least regionally, if not even more than that, but certainly regionally, we should be the power broker uh, of defense, uh, of economy, and of spirituality, uh, as I like to call it, the spiritual capital of the world. Let's go on. I'm not Jewish, and yet Israel to me is very important. That's why I did Golan Heights. Golan Heights is worth trillions of dollars, trillions of dollars. I called in our ambassador, David Friedman. I said, give me a little bit of a, a lesson, a history lesson on Golan Heights, five minutes or less, if possible. And he did. He gave me a very good, quick history lesson. And I made a decision. I gave you something that nobody else would have given you. But I mean, that shows you the power of an ambassador. Give your president a five-minute talk, and he's going to make decisions of, of global import and relevance, right? It's like, it's a little bit scary, right? It's like, give me a five-minute talk, and then I'll make a decision, you know, about the future of a whole country there. Uh, of course, as I said before, Israel had recognized the Golan Heights by itself. Uh, a long time ago, um, I think 1982. Uh, but okay, President Trump recognized that as well. But uh, as as the video shows, David Friedman had a big hand in that. The biggest thing I gave, look, I gave the capital of Israel and the, the whole thing with the embassy, which created the capital in a sense. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> 
no, 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 no. It did not create the capital. I love you, President Trump. God bless you. But you did not create Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. That was done about 3,000 years ago by King David. So that's very important there. Then it was it became the first temple under King Solomon. Later on became uh, the second temple under Ezra and Nehemiah, Nehemiah and the Maccabees. Uh, so we had two temples and two capitals in Jerusalem. Then the state of Israel fought uh, against six Arab countries and uh, liberated Jerusalem, established their third Commonwealth capital there. So America's recognition under President Trump uh, of Jerusalem as the capital of Israel is mucho grande important, okay? I love it. It was important, but let's not say that that created the capital of Israel. You know, let's just let's just keep it in proportion here. The, the capital of Israel was before America and probably will last after America as well. Mentioning Ambassador Friedman, he just presented a new plan. I don't know if you saw it. Um, suggesting that uh, the United States will recognize Israel's sovereignty over the West Bank or Judea and Samaria, the way it's called. Would you support such a plan? Well, they want to show it to me. They want to discuss it. I'm going to take a look at it. Look, I've been uh, doing a lot of things for Israel that's what's good for Israel, but I also want peace. I want to see peace like everyone else. You want to see peace too. Yeah, I want to see peace, but not at all costs. I want to see peace, but not sell us out. I want to see peace through the destruction of the enemies of Israel. I want to see peace that's going to be good for the region and not giving into Iran and other forms of jihadism that suppress the, the peoples of this region. I think that talking too much about peace is not right. You got to say right now it's a time of conflict. It's a time to push back, to erase, to clean house. Later on, uh, we'll start having peace. And of course, I do give... Again, President Trump, the credit for the Abraham Accords, which was a real movement towards recognition of Israel and through that regional peace. But they do want to show that to me, so they'll be doing that. Would you like to send any message to the people of Israel who is, are now in one of the most difficult times the country has experienced? I would send a message. I would send a message and I'll start off by saying I was the best president in the history of Israel. but. There was never been a president, and mostly anybody, whether it's a president or not, nobody did for Israel what I did for Israel, including defense, including billions and billions of dollars a year, four billion dollars a year for years when other people wanted to cut it off. But I will say that uh, Israel's in trouble. All right, so just to be fair here, President Obama, who's no great friend of Israel, also wanted to send money to Israel and, uh, and sign on the uh, Memorandum of Understanding the, the thing is that American aid is really not aid. It's joint defense development. It's very important to understand that. It is really money that a lot, most of it goes back to the United States, but basically develops joint munitions, joint arms, joint development. That's number one. Number two is what we see now is that Israeli dependence on the United States uh, is a strategic danger. Because if the United States wants to cut it off or take all the munitions and send it to Ukraine or whatever they want to do, if we are out of our own ability to either make arms, make jets, et cetera, uh, then that weakens us strategically. Moreover, it's not just about manufacturing. It's also about the ability to purchase weapons and weapon systems from other countries. And the United States blocks that. And I think it's important for Israel to diversify to be able to have a, a, a purchase partnership with India, with China, with Russia, with whoever, so that we're not solely dependent. We are a country that's oftentimes in danger, and therefore we cannot allow ourselves to be completely dependent on one country, even if it's an ally to the United States, because sometimes that ally doesn't exactly act like an ally. Right now, the United States is trying to shrink Israel, and that's not exactly an ally. And they're gonna, they want to weaken us. They want to weaken our battles even at Shifa Hospital. That's what generals are telling me. So therefore, it is a, it, it, giving money to Israel is good. Let's not exaggerate the case. $3 billion, $4 billion is a drop in the bucket in Israel's $500 billion GDP, a yearly GDP. So that's, a, that's important to remember that. But the point is, is that the future of the U.S.-Israel relationship is, is a, an, an, an alliance, but not a dependence. That has to be stopped. And I think October 7th has taught us that. Trouble right now. It's a troubled, it's a very troubled place. Uh, an attack happened that should have never been allowed to happen, both from the Israeli standpoint and from the United States standpoint. Uh, if they respected our president, which they don't, they have no respect for him whatsoever, that attack would not have happened. That's why it wouldn't have happened with me. 
But I say just be strong, be smart, and uh, let's get this over with. And when it's over with, you're gonna be back to having a great life. Look, I know Israel very well. I spent a lot of time there, and I have a lot of friends there, tremendous number of friends there. They're incredible people. It's an incredible place. Uh, you want the fighting to stop, everybody does. You have to finish up, but you want this, you gotta get, you gotta get back to having that country again the way it was. Uh, so sad that. Having the country the way it was means not giving away our land to the jihad. And the United States is one of the main culprits in Israel being in this mess today. Our defense situation is in many respects a, a direct result of listening to American foreign policy. If it's the Oslo Accords and the two-state solution, if it's the disengagement in 2005 giving away Gaza to the Hamas, if it's allowing, uh, if it's not first striking Hezbollah and not, not taking care of business. So let's not like sweep it all under the rug. The United States is at fault for much of Israel's strategic uh, uh, troubles. And so I would say, President Trump, before you rush to make sure that we go back on the track of peace, you got to clean up your mess. You got to let us clean up around here and be the regional power and smash all those enemies from within and from without that have been, been empowered by the United States. Let's be real. Let's not like BS the whole thing. Let's call a spade a spade. The United States is at fault for much of the bad policy around here. And Israelis, of course, who accept that uh, that dicta, dictate. We can't have that. Things have got to change. President Trump, let's not rush to make peace when there's still cleanup that has to be done. This could have happened. The, the date of October 7th is going to go down. It's just, just a terrible, what a terrible thing to happen. And it bothers me so much when I see people, they don't talk about October 7th anymore. They talk about how aggressive Israel is. And uh, it, it's amazing that... They're not talking about October 7th. And well, why don't they talk about it? They that? don't want to talk about it. When I talk about it, people don't want to hear about it. You know, they, you have... you have. A Let's be straight here. The reason that people don't want to hear about October 7th is because China, Russia, and others, and, and the pro-Jihad axis, they're fixated on the, the response part, Israel's strong response. And they have conveniently erased the reason for the strong response. That is uh, a great narrative attack on Israel that focuses in on the response. Uh, and you've got to, people like you, President Trump, have got to make it clear. Israel's fighting not just for October 7th. They're fighting an entrenched jihad that wants to destroy Israel. And they have every, not just right, every need to smash those enemies. And that goes back to the same thing that we said before. Don't try to overcome that. Don't try to rush it and say, let's get to peace. We got to make sure that it's clear to the world. There are bad guys. And, and most, most, most important is clear to ourselves, right? Before we even try to uh, get the world to buy into what we're saying, we got to make it clear to ourselves. There's no end to this war until its goals are achieved. And that is not just getting rid of Hamas. It's smashing jihadism and with the help of God, retaking full sovereignty over the land of Israel. A lot, you have a lot of people on the outside that are not friendly to Israel, and they're never gonna be friendly to Israel. And you have to be very careful. You're in a very treacherous, you know, we call it a neighborhood that's a little on the dangerous side, right? You're in a very dangerous neighborhood. And with Iran getting a nuclear weapon, once they have a nuclear weapon, uh, you'll be speaking to them a lot differently than you're speaking right now. They would have never had a nuclear weapon with me. They understood that. They would never have And had. they will not have a nuclear weapon with you if you again if you are reelected. They will never have a nuclear weapon, no. But you have a long time to go. They could have a nuclear weapon in 35 days. Ouch. That's that's a statement that I wouldn't doubt has some serious facts behind it. And again, it's American policy, American presidential policy under the Obama years and the Biden years, which has allowed Iran to become stronger and to be able to build up to this nuclear bomb. And uh, it's also American policy that has weakened Israeli response. And it's time to make sure that this doesn't go any further. And that's a hint to Israeli leadership, which is don't waste time succumbing to American diktat that's telling you not to act. You got to act strong right now. And defend the Jewish people from this scourge.
right? I have seven months to go and nine months to take office. A lot of bad things can happen in that. You know, that's a very, that's a lot. That's like an eternity. Seven months in this world, and especially in the Middle East, where it's so, it's so combative and so combustible. And uh, this would be a time, if we had a, a real president, if we had a president that knew what he was doing, that could put two sentences together, uh, that could get solved very quickly. The stepdaughter, if I'm not... Maybe, but the point, you said two different things, which is if you had a president, it would be solved quickly, but there's many months till that, and, and if. And so Israel's got to defend itself and protect its interests and not waste time waiting for the right president. We've got to act strong now and show the jihad who is the boss around here, who is the balabayit, who is that, that's in Hebrew, uh, for who's, who's the, who's the uh, owner of the house, uh, who's, who's going to govern around here and make sure that bad guys don't get out of control. Wrong of Kamala Harris uh, raised money for UNRWA. Yeah. What do you think about that? Well, I think that means you should never vote for them. How could a Jewish person vote for Kamala Harris? And uh, essentially, you know, that's what probably is going to happen. Because you look at this guy, he can't walk down a flight of stairs. He can't walk across a room. He can't find the exit to a stage where they have five different sets of stairs. Uh, you might have Kamala Harris if this doesn't work out. You have her right now. If something happened to him, you have her. And that's right, she supports the enemy. But he supports the enemy too. Remember this, I leave it with this. I think that's very true. Uh, uh, he supports the enemy. And I, I, can't, uh, I can't disagree. I think that Jewish people who love Israel, who are pro-Israel, who still think that it's a better idea to vote for Biden are misguided. And I say that lovingly. Uh, again, I, I think that people should, you know, American Jews should consider buying a home here in Israel and moving here to Israel and sending their kids here to Israel. Uh, and that's more important than who you're voting for. But at the end, don't vote for your countries. For even if you don't live in Israel, if you love Israel, don't vote Don't vote for our enemies because uh, the President Bidens of this world empower our enemies. And so if you empower Biden, you're empowering our enemies. I'm sorry. That's, that's just the truth. Uh, I don't mean to hurt anybody's feelings and I'm not trying to be like like partisan political. It's not an issue of Democrat versus Republican. It's just a simple fact that the Biden administration sends money to Iran and the Trump administration blocked money to Iran. That's that's just that simple. And so if you are concerned about the future of the Jewish people and don't want to make don't want to see a genocide because these people, the Hamas and their ilk, have proven that they would if they could do a genocide. They would if they could. And I think also it's important to talk about the other side which is the Abraham Accords, we could have a totally different way of doing things around here, which is a strong Israel, just awesome, with strong Arab countries, really like, like there could be a vision for an alternative here. It's not just about hate of the Arabs, God forbid, but it is about the fight against the jihad, which wants to destroy Israel, and then to liberate the people, liberate the people of Iran, so many of whom don't want this garbage. If Biden was for Israel, October 7th would have never happened, and it did happen. And probably the most tragic day in the history of Israel, one of the most tragic days of, in the history of any country, but he, this should never have happened. It shouldn't have happened from the Israeli standpoint, it shouldn't have happened from the United States. United States, if they respected our president, it would have never, ever happened. Thank you Mr. very President, much. thank you very much thank for you. this interview. Thank you no. both. All right, so thank you very much to President Trump. That is important stuff. Uh, Israel's got to be strong. That's really one of the most important things that, that has to be understood, even from this interview. Sure, you know, it, it would be great if there was an America that, that's making good policy and fighting against bad guys in this world, but Israel needs its independence. Israel doesn't need to rush to peace, but needs to fight its war properly until it takes care of business. And we also need to get back to our inner identity, our core identity, uh, which is tied into the land of Israel, which is tied into the Bible, which is tied into Hebrew and Judaism. Uh, and we have to uh, have relationship with the world. But at the same time, we got to stand alone when it comes to policy, make sure that the policies uh, are good for Israel. I want to thank you guys so much uh, for being with me. Check out more of my stuff at uh, this channel, Ishai Fleischer TV. Subscribe, you know, hit the bell, the whole thing. And that's a lot of fun. Uh, and also connect to us in many different ways at YishaiFleischer.com. Uh, and support us uh, at buymeacoffee.com buymeacoffee forward slash Yishai. God bless you and shalom.